I learned a ton of Joe Dart bass licks, 69 of them, and in doing all that, I've tried to decode the Joe Dart sound and figure out what makes him sound so great. Hi, I'm Luke from Become a Bassist, and if you want the shortcut to sounding just as funky as Joe, stealing all his licks, then check this video out. <laughs> This is where it happened. This is where I fell in love with Wolfpack and Joe Dart. During lockdown, I couldn't go to the gym, so I went to the roof of my building to try and get huge and stay huge. <laughs> and I listened almost exclusively to Wolfpack's Madison Square Garden concert. Damn. Just about everything Joe plays feels incredible, it sounds incredible, and it just makes me smile. So, I started learning everything he was doing. I, you know, I stole all the cool stuff from the Madison Square Garden concert, then I moved on to the rest of the Wolfpack catalogue, and you know, tried to learn everything and try and to decode that Joe Dart sound, so I could try and sound a bit more like him when the situation called for it. Now, I've learned a ton doing it, and I've boiled it down to essentially five concepts. I'll show you how to use these things in your own playing, including one quintessential Joe Dart lick that's almost like a shortcut to emulating him. Learn these and you'll be well on your way to sounding just like Joe Dart on the Joe Dart. Before we get into all that though, if you want the tabs and notation for all the Joe Dart licks I'll be talking about in this video, just click the link in the description and you can download a free PDF of them all. Now there are a few concepts, a few devices that Joe uses all the time, and if you know his playing, you've probably already guessed this, but there is a metric butt ton of pentatonic scales involved. He loves a minor pentatonic, like in My First Car. Or later on in that same song as well. And of course he loves his blues scales too, even though they're not technically pentatonic. Like in Corey Wong. Or Captain Hook. Wow. Or this particularly egregious example in Funky Duck. Check that out in slow motion. It's the same idea spread over three octaves in a single bar, so it's like that kind of um, that kind of bluesy uh, language. It spreads it over three octaves. This is a great example of having a really simple idea, but being able to get a lot of music out of it. Now, funnily enough, Joe only will occasionally use a straight-up major pentatonic. Every once in a while, he'll give it to you straight, like in My First Car. Or Mr. Finish Line. But more often than not, he likes to give the major pentatonic a little bit of a different flavour. We'll talk about that really soon. I'll show you the special sauce that Joe adds to it. Before that though, I want to show you concept number two that Joe uses all the time, and it's this kind of idea. In this song, it's just an E chord vamp. We get the three on E. One, two, three. But then we get this little nugget. We get, yeah, going from the second of the E chord up to the flat third of the E chord up to the major third of the E chord. So we get one, two, three. That right there, the two flat three major three. That thing there, he does this freaking everywhere, like in the Darwin Derby bass line. Hear it? It's over that second B flat chord. We get this in slow motion. Yeah, we get two flat three and three over the B flat. He does the same thing in Animal Spirits in the MSG concert, this time over a D flat chord. So from the low D flat up to two flat two then three so one two three four one two three four just like that 
The trick with pulling this off is to have the major third of the chord land on the beat that you want it to. And where that exactly is, is going to depend on the groove, whether you want to rhythmically anticipate things or not. Uh, so sometimes Joe will have that third of the chord land right on the beat, like in the Darwin Derby example. So we had one, two, three, landing on beat three there. One, two, three. Or landing on beat four, like in the Animal Spirits example. It's a bit different. One, two, three, four. Oh, pardon me. Right there, landing on beat four. Uh, and on the three on E bass line, it actually anticipates the following bar. So it lands on the uh of beat four. So one E and duh, or I guess four E and duh. So I just go one, two, three, four E and duh. Yeah, so we get that third, anticipating the start of the next bar. This is relatively easy to put into your own playing. It works over any major chord or any dominant chord. Uh, it's helpful for fills, for improvising, creating bass lines. All you need to do is start on the second of every chord and then just go up two frets. Now this works best on the G and sometimes the D string. So for example, if you had a chord progression going F, going to B flat, going to C, and then back to F, like a one, four, five, one progression, uh, you could do this whole thing. You can start on the F down here, play that root, or up there, and then to play that Joeism, you kind of go to the G and go up two frets. So two, flat three, then major three. You can do the same thing for the B flat chord, yeah? Two, flat three, major three, and then on the C chord, same thing. Two, flat three, major three. Now you can string that whole thing together and create a nice little groove. One, two, three, four. Yeah, very quick way to get, you know, a bit more of that Joe factor into your playing. Okay, so that's two harmonic things that Joe does. He uses the blues and minor pentatonics uh, and the two flat 33 device. But what about the rhythm? How is he using these harmonic ideas and, you know, layering them on top of his rhythm? Well, one signature of the Joe Dart sound is to pick the smallest subdivision of the song and go wild with, you know, relatively consistent streams of that rhythm. So if a song is 16th note based, he'll usually play pretty consistent lines of 16th notes for his fills and his licks. Like in uh, Daddy, He Got a Tesla. Daddy, he got a Tesla. Daddy, he got a Tesla. <laughs> Just straight up full bar of 16ths right there. Uh, he does the same thing in fills for songs like Test Drive. Or the closing lick of Wolfpack. And even when the song isn't based on 16ths, he still uses that smallest subdivision. For example, in his bass solo in Wait For The Moment, it's more based on a triplet feel. So what does he do at the end of his solo? He smashes a bunch of triplets, raises the intensity, and launches the whole band into the final chorus. Check it out. It's a similar idea though, it's picking the smallest subdivision of the song and really going for it. Now it's not like that's all Joe does, just constant barrages of 16ths or triplets, but it is a pretty signature move for him when it comes to fills and, you know, a bit of the fancy licks and all that stuff. The other thing that's crucial when it comes to rhythm that Joe does is never letting a, you know, a fancy lick or a cool fill get in the way of the groove. Everything we've talked about so far. Uh, at the end of phrases, Joe is hitting beat one super hard, super in the pocket. Listen to this monster fill in Dean Town, and notice how solid it is when the fill is over. It's so smooth, right? There's no kind of break in between, you know, the fancy fill and the groove. It's just, you know, one to the other, super, super smooth. Same for his bass break in Corey Wong. The fancy bits are just as in the pocket as when he's playing the simpler stuff. And if you want to be able to do this for yourself, then having super strong time and a deep pocket is essential. So how do you practice this? Well, according to the man himself, he practiced religiously with a drum machine. 
But if you can play with a real life solid drummer, that's even better. So that brings us to our quintessential Joe Dart lick. This is the one that if you learn and start plugging into your own bass lines, your own playing, it's like a shortcut to emulating Joe Dart. Why? Because he plays it everywhere, and basically every chance he gets, he's playing this kind of lick. Uh, check him playing it on Corey Wong. Or in the middle of his Wait for the Moment solo. You better play that bass, boy. Or multiple times, super egregiously, on It Gets Funkier 4. At its core, it's this kind of idea. Yeah, you're starting on the root of a major chord or a dominant chord. In this case, it's an A flat. Yeah, then we're playing the two, flat three, then three. You know, just like our two, flat three, uh, regular three uh, device from before. Then we go up to the five, then the sixth, then up to the root and octave above. Now the thing I love about this, it's like a combination noodle of everything we've talked about so far. It's kind of like a major pentatonic, you've got that added kind of extra note in there, the flat three. So we actually get that two flat three three idea that Joe uses everywhere else as well. Uh, if you wanted to, you could even think about this like a blues scale starting from the second note. So it's almost like the second mode of the blues scale. Uh, now I don't think about it like this, uh, and honestly it doesn't really matter what you call it, but that's the sound. Yeah? Let's take it a little bit slower and play along with Joe on It Gets Funkier 4 on that A flat 7 chord. Let's have a go. Yeah? That's the kind of idea. Yeah, a lot of notes, uh, and you know, take it a bit slower once you're, uh, you know, getting used to it. But I hope that makes sense. Now, if you want to get to know these leaks really well, I definitely recommend you download the PDF with the tabs and notation for everything, including this particular link, uh, lick from the link in the description. Once you have that shape under your fingers, though, you can do all kinds of things, bass lines, licks, fills, or even just full-on improvising. It's just a matter of plugging that shape in and letting the language do its work. So for example, let's say we had that same one, four, five, one progression we had from before. Our chords would be F, B flat, C, and then F again. Uh, let's, uh, because they're all major chords, you can just plug that shape into each chord and you have a ready-made bass line that you know is gonna sound good. So check it out, let's make something uh, over those chords. One, two, three, four. Yeah, that same kind of language, all from that quintessential Joe Dart lick. All that kind of stuff. All right, concept number five. Now you can't talk about Joe without talking about the sound that he gets. Super punchy, almost biting sound. Now, it could be very tempting to see Joe play his signature music man, his Mark Bass amps and the specific strings. And you know, you might be tempted to go out and wanna buy everything that he uses. But that alone is not gonna make you automatically sound like Joe. He could sound exactly like himself playing on just about any gear. It's not the gear that makes up the majority of the sound, it's Joe, it's the tone in his hands. And maybe more importantly, his time and his feel. Joe has immaculate time and incredible feel and that's a big part of his sound. Just listen to him playing his extended bass solo in Beastly. Now there's no drums or anything, it's just the bass, but you could easily dance to that, right? A great exercise for developing this kind of thing is to just try and do it for yourself. So play sixteenths on a single note, accent in groups of four, and just see how consistent you are with the time, the tone, and the feel. You can start a bit slower if you want, if you haven't got the right hand stamina yet, but just try it on the sixteenth note. So groups of four. Might go a bit faster. 
bit faster again. Oh. And the other thing is, how long can you go? How's your stamina? Because Joe, he can go for a long time. <laughs> now, when you can do it on one note, try playing an actual bass line, like the line from Dean Town, either by yourself or along with the recording or with a drum machine. The time and the groove, super important. Now as far as actually trying to get the sound that Joe gets with gear, there are kind of five things that'll really help. Uh, getting some flat wound strings is really going to help, that's number one. But if you don't actually want to change the strings on your bass, you can do a couple of other things as well. Now if you have a tone control on your bass, turn it all the way down or at least most of the way down. That's going to take away a lot of the kind of high end brightness that you probably don't want for a kind of Joe Dart sound. So for example, if I turn my treble all the way up, you know, it's just the wrong kind of vibe. It's just not what you want uh, if you're going for that kind of sound. Uh, now, if you do have active electronics like me, uh, definitely mess with those. Uh, right now, I'm favoring my bridge pickup. That's at 100%. My um, neck pickup isn't on at all. Uh, my treble is down all the way and my bass is about maybe 20% of the way up. It's enough to keep it beefy, but not so much that it's muddy. Thing number three that you can do is put a piece of foam under the strings between the bridge and the first pickup. Just kind of stuff it in here like this. Make sure it's touching all the strings so it's nice and consistent. And what that's going to do is kind of deaden all the strings even more. And Joe actually does this sometimes. Check him out playing on the cup stacker. See that big piece of foam under his strings? He's no stranger to this trick, but here's what it sounds like. Versus this, if I kind of get the thing out of the way. Yeah, it's going to make the sound a little bit shorter. And it's probably going to be more noticeable on the, the D and the G strings. But you still can hear it on the E and the A strings as well. It's just going to you know make the sound a bit thicker and a bit more dead. Thing number four you can do is simply pluck closer to the bridge rather than closer to the neck. That's going to give your sound uh, a bit more bite. So here's our neck versus, yeah, if we go on the E string. Bit of a difference there, right? There's a bit more, you know, bite. And that's exactly where Joe plucks a lot of the time. Check out his plucking hand on Dean Town. He's absolutely picking right over that bridge pickup. And finally, thing number five you can do to get a more Joe Dart bass tone is to compress the snot out of your signal. So when Joe records with Wolfpack, he records directly into the desk, just like I'm doing now, uh, no amplifier at all, and then Jack Stratton adds a ton of compression in post. But if you want that kind of sound live, then using a compression pedal might actually be a pretty good idea. Now, like I said, gear is a part of the equation, but more importantly, to get that Joe Dart sound, it's about time, stamina, language, vocabulary, doing your best to capture Joe's essence, and you can most likely get pretty close to that sound with the gear that you already have. Uh, now, of course, if you want, there's nothing stopping you from like going out and buying all the Joe gear. If that's more your style, you know, go for it. But you will still have to focus on those other things. Just because you have a Joe Dart bass doesn't mean you can automatically automatically have, you know, Joe Dart's time, strength, stamina, vocabulary, all that stuff. Now I've been saying Joe Dart licks a lot, but just know that none of these pieces of language, the blues and pentatonics, the two flat three, three lick, uh, the rhythms that Joe uses, the quintessential Joe Dart lick, and the sound, Joe would have picked all these up from other places and internalized them over time and made them his own. And his bandmates have done the same thing as well. You can use, uh, you can hear, sorry, the fragments and licks that they use themselves. Check out Theo playing the, you know, quintessential Joe Lick during a guitar solo. And here's Corey Wong actually playing that exact Joe Dart Lick on bass on one of his own songs. That's me. 
The point here is that you don't have to, you know, create your own language and licks. You can learn from others, adapt them to your own voice, and that's exactly what Joe has done. You can't do that though if you don't know exactly what Joe is doing, what he's playing. So if you want all the tabs, notation for all 69 Joe Dart licks, I've got them available as a free download on becomeabassist.com. To get them all and start playing exactly what Joe plays, just click the link in the description down there or click right here, fill out the form on that page and I'll send them all to you and you can start learning all this Joe Dart language today. Hopefully I'll see you in there.